All right, so in this, uh, this next section, I want to talk about all the different uh, individual elements and um, describe some of their basic physiological functions and what it is that they really do inside plants and how we need to manage them. So if we look at um, the one, I'm going to be, I'll try to describe very clearly what is the one thing that you need to know about each of these different nutritional elements. So if we look, we're going to start with potassium. The one thing that you need to know about potassium is that potassium is the carbohydrate transport locomotive. It moves sugars around inside the plant. I was describing flow and transport where sugars are moved from the photosynthetic factory, the leaves, to the various sugar sinks, the root system, the new growth, the fruit. And so as potassium moves these sugars, when potassium is moving sugars from the leaves, as it goes down to the root system or when it goes up to the new growth, that potassium is then recycled. It goes back into the leaf and it does that same job over and over and over again. It doesn't get used up. 97% of the potassium inside a plant is in the sap. It's not inside the cells. It's actually the extracellular fluid that is constantly moving around inside the plant. So the fruit, however, are a very different sugar sink from the other two because the fruit are a storage organ. There is essentially a one-way entry gate for sugars and consequently for potassium into fruit. So any fruit that has very high pectin, starch, carbohydrate content um, is going to have very strong, be a very strong potassium sink and is going to export potassium from that field. The potassium is one of these elements that is very mobile. It moves around very quickly and because of that, deficiencies first show up in the old leaves. So situations in which we see uh, potassium deficiencies showing up, um, we don't actually see potassium deficiencies show up very often because potassium is so readily absorbed by plants. Plants pick it up very readily. If there is any adequate potassium supply in the soil, uh, they will pick it up very, very quickly. Uh, in cases where you have excess of phosphorus, uh, excess of phosphorus is definitely going to create a potassium deficiency. And something else that can uh, actually reduce the absorption of potassium is when you have manganese deficiencies. As I described earlier in the case of the um, tomato production in eastern Pennsylvania that I was talking about, when we fixed the manganese problem, all of a sudden potassium came up all on its own. Even though we had generous supplies of potassium in the soil, the plants were not picking it up because we have manganese deficiencies. If we look at calcium, the, excuse me one moment, I'm going to move this where I can actually see it. The, the one thing that we need to know about calcium is calcium is a key component of building cell membranes and cell membrane structures. So whenever we talk about having very rapid cell division, cell expansion, or very rapid cell division and cell replication, we need to have good calcium to form good cell membrane structure. So calcium, again, is not flow mobile. It doesn't move around from a foliar spray. When you put on a foliar spray of calcium, it doesn't move into the fruit. And it doesn't move to other locations inside the plant unless it is in a chelated form. And because of this... Real quickly, I'm sorry, John. On, when you talk about a chelated form, I mean, there's a hundred ways to chelate something. I mean, is there, is there certain ways that are better? And What's the difference between like a chelation and then a complex? Okay, so uh, there definitely are substantial differences in the performance of various chelates. And the, the, the main question is when a chelate, first of all, is the chelate actually absorbed? Secondly, when it is absorbed, how quickly does it release the element that it's holding on to? Uh, so in other words, does it release that calcium inside the leaf? Or does it release very quickly? Or does it actually hold on to that calcium for an extended period of time so that calcium can be transported out of the leaf and into the fruit or wherever, or wherever it is needed? So there are substantial differences between uh, different chelates and the, that are largely dependent on their chelation constants, the chelation coefficients for the various uh, different minerals that they bind to. And I'm rather hes hesitant because I honestly don't know what AgroK uses and I'm afraid of stepping on toes, but 
um, our observation, our experience has been that EDTA trace minerals, particularly EDTA calcium, um, are effective at moving the calcium number, but they're not always effective at actually changing the plant's physiological response. And the, the key to that, I think, is because EDTA has such a strong bond, such a strong hold on calcium, that it doesn't release it very readily when it gets into the plant. And in fact, we have seen um, this same problem when uh, we have seen other trace mineral EDTA chelates used as a foliar spray, where the EDTA was not fully utilized. And when it landed on a leaf surface, it has a very strong attraction for calcium, and it will actually pull calcium out of the leaf. We have seen EDTA pull calcium out of the leaf when the EDTA product that was applied wasn't fully chelated. So I have some reservations around that. It, it does, definitely does need to be very carefully managed. Uh, and then regarding your question about um, complexes, um, I mean, calcium can be complex with many different um, compounds. So it, again, is going to do, the, the question is, how quickly is that complex going to be degraded? How quickly is it going to be digested in the leaf? Is it actually going to move into the fruit, or is it still going to all be deposited in the leaf? And that's something I don't have an answer for. The calcium nitrate, uh, calcium nitrate is interesting in that it has a uh, very interesting ionic state. However, uh, calcium nitrate as an ionic nitrogen is not technically a chelate or a complex, and we don't find that it moves into fruit very readily in our experience. Is that, you have any comments on that? Have you seen different? No, I just think that's a pretty common combination. And how does the, the, how does the nitrate split off from the calcium and do its thing? And uh, how does that happen and then the calcium? Yeah, no, the, um, it usually, calcium nitrate tends to ionize in solution. Um, and particularly when it is absorbed by plants, it gets ionized fairly quickly, and so you quickly have calcium ions and nitrate ions separated. Yep. So um, calcium deficiencies are um, one of the major challenges that we see with fruit production, and as I described, since we need calcium in xylem transport, we need to have a constant supply. We need to have calcium being delivered to that fruit, and we need to have calcium being delivered uh, into the entire plant structure every single day. Every day. This, this is a very strong, uh, one of the pieces, we, today we're talking a lot about nutrition management, managing nutrient applications, foliar applications, irrigation applications, and so forth. But the reality is that much of what we're talking about can be completely short-circuited by improper cultural management. If you don't irrigate properly, if you irrigate too much or not enough, uh, too much water, not enough water, then uh, you can undo everything else that you're trying to do with nutrition management. Water management is still king. It's still primary, it's still foundational. And um, water management is going to have a, a lot of impact on calcium and potassium availability. So, um, before I continue with this discussion, I have a quick question. How many of you were not here yesterday? Okay, a number of you. Um, I will bring it into the conversation. I'll, I'll uh, add some additional slides to the slide deck for the discussion this afternoon because um, I did not include them today. But there is some very important interactions between calcium and potassium that are critical to understand for managing uh, fruit quality and fruit integrity. So. Um, what I'll say for the moment is that the single biggest challenge that we see with calcium is overabsorption of potassium because potassium and manganese very strongly antagonize each other. And so in order to have high quality fruit, in order to have adequate levels of calcium, we have to manage potassium availability. And the biggest challenge that we see is we have, we, potassium is very soluble in soil. It's very soluble in soil solution and plants absorb it very quickly. They absorb potassium like candy. It's like putting a candy dish in front of a kid and telling them that they can have the candy or they can have, I don't know what an, an alternate would be, but the calcium does not get absorbed nearly as quickly as the potassium does. So if you give them a choice between the two, they will always take the potassium first. So the potassium levels need to be kept moderate in the soil profile and metered out. Where you want to have, where you need to have high levels of potassium is during the fruit fill stage. Once you get to fruit fill, 
where you have the locomotive all moving into the fruit, that is the time when you need to have high levels of potassium. You don't want high levels of potassium early when you need calcium to form uh, embryos and to, and to drive growth and cell division. Additional uh, scenarios when we see calcium deficiencies is when we have low levels of boron. So it is actually possible if you have uh, high boron or high calcium, excuse me, high calcium soils, and it would seem that you should have good calcium availability. If you have low boron, you'll actually have the potential for a calcium deficiency. Yes. I am saying that high levels of soil available potassium suppress the soil absorption of calcium, which results in an imbalance in the plant sap where you have high potassium and low calcium in the plant sap. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions on that? I missed the first part of your question. Can you repeat that? On the cat the soil cation exchange, this greater than five percent of potassium ion. Would that would that be getting excessive because of this? Um so the question was, is greater than five percent percent base saturation of potassium and excess and would, would that create the problem that I'm describing? Um not necessarily. It depends on the crop. There are some crops like um bell peppers and Honeycrisp apples will have excessive levels of potassium in the sap at one and a half percent base saturation potassium. And other crops uh, don't absorb potassium nearly as, or, or I should say they don't overabsorb potassium nearly as readily, like tomatoes for example. So uh, on tomatoes you can have potassium levels up to five to six to seven percent. The interesting part is that uh, for potassium, for potassium management, Manganese applications are the thermostat for potassium. When you have adequate levels of manganese, it will kind of regulate the potassium absorption from the soil profile, also regulate potassium movement inside the plant. And the same holds true of calcium, where boron is to some degree the thermostat for calcium, and also vice versa. So um, there is this interesting phenomena where uh, we have observed that Calcium and boron are both synergistic and antagonistic. And the simplest way to describe that is they are the thermostat for each other. So calcium regulates boron uptake and absorption, and boron regulates calcium uptake and absorption. What this means in terms of practical management is let's say you have a crop uh, that is growing on calcium rich soil, and yet the crop itself is calcium deficient. It's not absorbing calcium as well as it could. There are two possible approaches to that problem. One is you can put on a foliar spray of calcium and you'll get a response. The second is you can also put on a foliar spray of boron without one drop of calcium and the calcium content of the crop is likely to go up, sometimes substantially. And the same also holds true for the opposite. If you have soils that have a high boron content or in some cases some, of the, some parts of the country that we work with in California and Oxnard area for example, they have very high boron irrigation water and yet they have plants that have difficulty absorbing those levels of boron. We simply put on a foliar application of calcium and the boron levels come up all on their own without directly addressing the boron. It's been our experience that this does not work with a soil application. You cannot soil apply. If you have, a, in our earlier example I talked about, when you have high calcium soils but a calcium poor crop, a soil application of boron doesn't produce that response, but a foliar application does in our experience. Um, so the question was, when we, when we foliar apply manganese, will the plant absorb potassium to an optimal level or will it even absorb it beyond an optimal level? We have, we have never yet observed it increasing beyond an optimal level. It seems to have the magic homeostatic switch that it knows exactly where that plant needs to be. The reality is, in this entire conversation, we can talk a lot about plant physiology, the chemistry, the biochemistry. We can make it sound really, really complicated. But at the end of the day, it is not that complicated. 
Why? Because it was designed to work. It was designed to work. And what we have observed over and over again is that when we give plants the right nutrition and the right materials that they need to support and drive plant development, they will do it. They will figure it out. We just need to give them the right materials and get out of the way. And often getting out of the way is one of the biggest pieces. Yes? So then if manganese is applied in the spring of the year after blossoming with fruit set on apples, you're saying that it, it'll take it to the optimum level. And that, that degree of potassium need at that time is probably less than the plant. But right. if you apply manganese later in the fall, when there's a greater need for potassium, is that where you get a greater spike in all right, really, really good question. And I think something that I failed to address um, adequately, the question was, uh, well, I think many of you heard the question, so I won't repeat the question, but um, what we have observed is that in order for plants to perform at a higher plateau of performance than what many farmers are used to observing, you need to have consistency of nutrient supply throughout the growing season. And that means that you do not put on one manganese application at the beginning of the year, another in the fall. It means that you do not apply two applications of zinc in the growing season or one application of boron when you think the plant needs it. Those specific timings are important, but you need to apply smaller quantities consistently throughout the growing season. That is when you get your biggest crop response. You have to have consistency of supply throughout the entire growing season. You will get, if you put on uh, one, I'm just going to use, I'll use zinc as an example. If you put on a zinc application um, early in the growing season on apples, you're going to get a very strong response. But if you keep that zinc application, maybe reduce it by 30 to 50 percent, and then spread out the remainder of that zinc for the next two months, you're going to get a much bigger response than you will if you all front load it. The plant responds completely differently. It is not the same. And so, with our uh, nutrient management systems that we put together, um, we look at continuous applications throughout the entire growing season for many of these different trace minerals. <coughs> and at, at, at not always, at the, I'm not suggesting at the exact same application rate. There are periods where you have peak demand and peak load for specific nutrients that you need to put on a higher application rate. So it's not necessarily flat all the way across the board. Um, and specifically for tree fruit, the most important the most critical, uh, yesterday I talked about critical points of influence. The greatest critical point of influence on tree fruit is after harvest. You can have more of an impact on a tree's health and its future production potential after harvest than you can at any other point during the growing season. Because at that stage, that tree is no longer under nutrient load. And with foliar applications at that point, you can have a much bigger impact on that tree's nutritional integrity than you can at any other point during the growing season. So, let's talk about magnesium. The one thing that you need to know about magnesium is that magnesium is the center ion of the chlorophyll molecule. So, there are four nutrient elements that will turn a plant dark, bright green. All of you know what one of them is, nitrogen. Magnesium will do the exact same thing because uh, if you look at the chlorophyll, the center of the chlorophyll structure, you have a single ion of magnesium surrounded by four nitrogens. And there's obviously more to that structure as well, but that's the core. And so when you increase magnesium concentrations, you have the potential to increase chlorophyll concentrations as well. Magnesium is very mobile. It moves around in plants very quickly. It first becomes deficient in the old leaves. This is when uh, we often see modeling or chlorosis on the older leaves. It can be triggered by a magnesium deficiency as well as by nitrogen. Um, and we don't often see uh, magnesium deficiencies show up. And when they do show up, they're fairly easily corrected. Plants absorb magnesium very quickly. They move it around very quickly. Uh, and, and obviously, there's a number of magnesium foliar sprays that are very effective. Uh, we usually see magnesium deficiencies showing up when we have excessive levels of potassium or excessive levels of sodium. It can all produce magnesium deficiencies. Um, sodium. We Often, more, off, more frequently have challenges with sodium excesses than we do with sodium deficiencies. It is required by several different crops. But the one thing that you need to know about sodium 
is that there is a direct correlation between sodium concentrations and fruit firmness. This is maybe less of a problem for <coughs> apples and tree fruit production, but it's very valuable for berries on uh, cherries and strawberries and uh, blueberries and raspberries and so forth. F cell firmness is a result of the turgor pressure, the water pressure inside the cell. And so it's basically all about how much water can you hold within that cell without bursting cell walls. So this is why uh, on cherries, for, uh, for example, if you have a very slight rainfall just before harvest, you actually have firmer cherries. I'm talking very slight rainfall, a couple hundreds of an inch per acre. But if you go above that, if you go beyond that, they will actually split, uh, or they have the tendency to split. But before they split, they first become firmer. So the question is, okay, how can you induce more water to move into the fruit and actually have firmer fruit without splitting the fruit? And sodium is one of the elements that can help increase turgor pressure inside the cell because sodium is very hydrophilic. It absorbs water. It pulls, pulls water to itself. And remember, when I talked about potassium, 97% of the potassium inside a plant is outside the cell. It's not inside the cell. But sodium will move into the cell and be inside the cell. So when you have sodium inside the cell, sodium is actually what absorbs water and pulls water to itself and gives you greater turgor pressure. So uh, sodium can be used to replace potassium for a very few crops. Uh, it's very seldom deficient. Um, first becomes excessive in the old leaves. It is needed by some plants that have C4 photosynthetic pathway, particularly on uh, corn production. We've seen some very interesting responses from applications of sodium on corn production, uh, and, on, on uh, switchgrass and uh, milo, millet, several of those C4 pathway plants. Uh, whenever we have sodium that is excessive, either in the soil or in, <coughs> or in the leaf structure, we see that it antagonizes calcium and potassium absorption both. Uh, and it can do that very substantially. Sodium is similar to calcium, or excuse me, to potassium, but to an even greater degree that a very small amount of sodium in the soil can translate to very large amounts of sodium in the plant because it is so readily absorbed. It's very soluble in water and the plants pick it up very, very quickly. So even though you may have a low level of sodium in the soil, you can end up with having very high levels of sodium in the plant. All right, so let's talk about nitrogen for a little bit in its various forms. Nitrogen is really fascinating. So when you have ammonium nitrogen, um, I use this symbol of a neon sign to represent what ammonium does to plants in plants' relationship to insects. So there is some really fascinating research that was done by a professor uh, Dr. Philip Callahan at the University of Florida Gainesville in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Philip Callahan was uh, an entomologist, but uh, his, all of his funding was provided by the U.S. military. Many of his, uh, all of his research was classified for many years uh, because uh, his research was on plant-insect communication systems. And they, the base, his, his research was the basis for developing, anti, for, uh, developing um, radar cloaking devices for military aircraft. So what he identified, very simply, just to summarize it all down, is that plants and insects communicate in the infrared spectrum. And uh, in Philip's own words, he said that um, unhealthy plants, plants that have a strong infrared charge, show up on an insect's antenna like a neon light against a dark background. And they are visible for about 1,500 to 1,700 yards on most insects' antenna. So that's approximately a mile. So insects can pick up unhealthy plants at a distance of approximately a mile, depending on humidity and environmental conditions. Now, the interesting part is that ammonium is an extremely strong infrared amplifier. It's an infrared pump. It amplifies the infrared signal. So what we have seen, what we've observed, is that uh, whenever we have plants that have a higher ammonium concentration, they are very susceptible to sucking, chewing insects. So um, yesterday I briefly talked about uh, ex the hops example of a hops grower that we worked with. We, I was able to predict um, infection of white flies and spider mites by looking at the ammonium number. 
we see a very strong correlation between high ammonium levels and spider mite infections and white flies and several other diseases, or several other insects. So ammonium, um, let's talk for just a moment about how nitrogen is metabolized in plants. So when plants pick up nitrogen from the soil, they can absorb that nitrogen in four different forms. They can absorb nitrogen in the form of nitrate, in the form of ammonium, in the form of urea, or, or uh, amino acids. So when plants pick up nitrogen um, in the form of amino acids, obviously they're directly transported to the upper part of the plant, very quickly used to build peptides and complete proteins. Same holds true of urea. Urea is very rapidly converted to the amine amino acid form. Uh, but let's talk for just a moment about the differences between nitrate and ammonium because plants metabolize them completely differently. So when plants pick up ammonium from the soil profile, that ammonium is converted to amino acids in the root system. It never makes it to the upper part of the plant in the form of ammonium, or it shouldn't if that plant is metabolizing it well. So when it gets to the upper part of the plant then, the amino acids are very rapidly uh, used to build peptides and proteins. When a plant picks up nitrate, however, that nitrate is transported from the root system up into the upper part of the plant, into the leaves, and that plant now spends a tremendous amount of energy processing and converting that nitrate from nitrates to nitrites to ammonium and then to amino acids. It's a very long process and it takes a tremendous amount of energy. To give you an example of how much energy, when a corn plant absorbs 80% of its total nitrogen supply in the form of nitrate, it takes 12% of its total photosynthetic energy just to convert nitrates to amino acid. It's a tremendous energy investment that that plant is making. So the most energy efficient form of nitrogen for plants to absorb, number one is amino acids and followed by urea, but then secondly is ammonium, or thirdly is ammonium nitrogen. Nitrate is very energy inefficient, it takes a lot of energy to convert nitrate. So now, um, when we look at ammonium, it is mobile, it does move around, it tends to become excessive first in the new growth. And when we look at areas when we have excess of ammonium showing up, when you have excess of ammonium showing up in the plant sap, there are two indicators that correlate very strongly to a number of different disease and insect pests, and they're excess of ammonium and excess of nitrate. We'll talk about nitrate in just a bit. But uh, the question becomes, when, okay, so you have a plant that is growing, it's absorbing ammonium from the soil, and all that ammonium is being converted to amino acids, so why is ammonium showing up in the, in the leaves? The ammonium isn't supposed to make it to the leaf. Where is it coming from? It's coming from one of these processes. Uh, first of all, uh, like on corn production, if you put on an excessive ammonium application, it can bypass the root system and get into the upper part of the plant in the form of ammonium. Uh, on some rare occasions, I've seen where you have a farmer overstimulated biology and you had a hyperactive microbiology, you ended up with very high ammonium levels in the, uh, in the upper part of the plant. But for the most part, ammonium in the plant in the leaf surface comes from either senescence, where you have catabolism instead of anabolism, or it comes from photorespiration. So let's talk about photorespiration for just a moment. We're working with hundreds of tomato high tunnels on the East Coast. And after working with sap analysis for a couple of years in these various tomato high tunnels, we're addressing all of these various uh, minerals, trace minerals, balancing everything. We're working with molybdenum and cobalt and uh, silicon and a broad array of minerals. And we have been very successful at uh, managing disease and insects on all of these operations. About 25% of them are completely 100% disease and insect free just by managing nutrition. And the remaining 75% are completely disease and insect free with the exception of a specific profile of three pests. They have very, very high, they have problems with spider mite, they have problems with white flies, and they have problems with leaf mold. Those three show up like clockwork on all these other operations. And they all have high ammonium levels in the plant sap and we can't figure out where it's coming from. We're not putting on any nitrogen. Uh, we have moderate levels of microbiology, but not extreme levels of microbiology. Why do we have these high ammonium levels in showing up in the plants? So what is actually happening is 
Uh, this happened two years ago, and we had this experience and went down a really interesting rabbit hole of exploring nitrogen metabolism. So when plants, um, when you have this high heat environment in the high tunnels, July and August, it gets up, up above 80 plus degrees Fahrenheit. You now trigger photorespiration instead of photosynthesis. And the warmer it gets, a greater proportion of photorespiration you have. So in the respiration process, plants still need an energy source. They still need to be alive. They, they need to keep, continue functioning. But they can no longer get energy from photosynthesis because the photosynthesis has shut down. So they will actually degrade proteins and break down proteins. It's called the prote proteolysis process, protein breakdown. And, in that, uh, and use, that, use those proteins as an energy source. And during that process, they will accumulate ammonium in the leaf. So when we started looking at what was happening in the leaves, uh, we started asking the question, OK, in all natural processes and all living systems, any time there is flow in one direction, there is always a counterpart. There has to be a counterpart that allows for flow in the opposite direction. There has to be a way for plants to metabolize ammonium in the leaves and convert it back to peptides or, and to proteins. Obviously, something is working on 25% of these high tunnels that isn't working on the other 75%. What is it? What could it be? Um, we're already addressing a wide, range, a wide array of trace minerals. And so I, I, was, I did a tremendous amount of research to try to uh, identify the metabolic pathways for ammonia metabolism in the leaf. And I was able to find the metabolic pathways, but I was not able to identify the enzyme cofactors that were involved. Um, I was not able to find that research. So uh, instead, um, I started looking at other places, and I realized that uh, legumes are said to require nickel as an essential enzyme cofactor for ammonium metabolism, particularly for the uh, rhizobium symbiotic bacteria. So we did an experiment on a tomato high tunnel that was growing Jolly Elf grape tomatoes, uh, five high tunnels side by side, had a severe, that particular variety is exceptionally susceptible to spider mites, had a severe spider mite load. And so we did a foliar spray in the center high tunnel out of the five. We picked one high tunnel, four rows of, of grape tomatoes, and we put on a foliar spray with a very, uh, what I thought was a very aggressive application of nickel. We said, we're going to lose this crop anyhow. We're either going to fix the problem or kill it trying. Put on a very aggressive application of nickel. <coughs> 48 hours later, the spider mites were gone. There was not a single spider mite to be found in the entire high tunnel. We, con we pulled a sap analysis, and nickel is not being tested on the sap analysis, so we weren't able to see what happened. But uh, there were three very distinct noticeable differences between the treated and the untreated area. We did sap analysis before, sap analysis immediately after. And on the treated area, sugar content on the treated area increased by 40% in 48 hours. Ammonium levels went from 450 parts per million to under 100 parts per million. And all the other trace mineral metals, copper, zinc, manganese, and iron, increased by 30 to 40% across the board. And we didn't apply one of them. That all happened from one nickel application on tomatoes. Now, I know that according to the official wisdom, nickel is not a required element for tomato production. But from this point forward, all the growers that we're working with, we are applying nickel onto tomatoes uh, in very, very small quantities. It does not take a lot. So uh, what we learned is that um, what we deduced from that experience is that nickel is obviously one of the enzyme cofactors that is required for ammonia metabolism in the leaf when you have very strong photorespiration. And I believe, um, just as a commentary, one of the greatest challenges that farmers have to work with in the future is going to be developing climate resilience. We have increasing extremes and increasing vagaries of the weather where we have very high heat aggressive cold, moisture extremes. And uh, I believe that we need to develop ways, uh, one of the tools that we will have to develop to manage high heat conditions is making sure we're able to manage photorespiration well. And I think nickel plays a part in that process. So um, I talked briefly about uh, nitrate and 
its role uh, in being metabolized in the foliage and the tremendous energy commitment that that requires from the plant. Um, it is fairly mobile. And one of the interesting things about nitrate is that excesses can accumulate in either the old or the new growth. It is most commonly the old growth, but not always. And the reason for this, uh, well, there's a number of reasons. Um, it's not common. We don't commonly see accumulation in the new growth, but it does happen in a few select instances, particularly in apple varieties that are susceptible to fire blight. So when you have fire blight susceptibility, it's often because we'll see very high levels of nitrate in the new shoots at the upper part of the plant, and uh, also, as I mentioned yesterday, often associated with iodine deficiencies. So uh, excessive levels of nitrate usually occur from excessive application or deficiencies of one of these three elements, moly, magnesium, sulfur. There is um, whenever, so all of these insects that have simpler digestive systems, corn rootworm, uh, weevils, um, European corn borer, corn earworm, cabbage looper, tomato hornworm, all these larval insects have a relatively simple digestive enzyme process, that means, which means that they are incapable of digesting complete proteins, incapable of digesting peptides. So they're dependent on amino acids and soluble organic nitrogen sources in the plant sap as a protein source. And what we have found is that it has been uh, managing ammonium and getting ammonium levels down to a zero to a non detect in plant sap has been a challenge. But getting a, a nitrate levels to a zero is a very straightforward process where when you have adequate levels of these three elements, there is a direct linear correlation. Providing adequate levels of magnesium, sulfur, and moly, the nitrate levels should drop very fast. And you should be able to achieve resistance to all of these, this entire group of insects very quickly. I love it when farmers tell us that their major problem is aphids or white flies because we will come in and fix this ratio, the aphids and the white flies disappear and they think we just worked something magical. Makes us look really, really good. <laughs> so uh, are there any questions on that interaction? Chloride. Um, chloride is associated with sodium in producing fruit firmness and turgor pressure, which I uh, discussed earlier. Uh, it's also very mobile. Uh, doesn't isn't, it's very seldom deficient, first becomes excessive in the old leaves. And when we have excessive chloride, one of the major challenges that we see is that it antagonizes nitrate absorption and we can actually develop uh, nitrogen deficiencies from excessive chloride. So in particular, um, for a number of different crops, we see most of our challenges with chloride when we have irrigation water that has very high levels of chloride concentrations. We look at a critical ratio of total chloride versus total nitrogen. Not nitrate, but total nitrogen. And we find that when the total chloride becomes higher than the total nitrogen, that plant's disease susceptibility has just gone up exponentially. They become much more susceptible to diseases when we have those high chloride concentrations. So we definitely need to manage chloride and keep those levels low. get the sense I'm putting you guys to sleep. Yep. So, uh, potassium chloride, I am not a fan of potassium chloride as a fertilizer. It has its uses and it is appropriate in the right place at the right time, but I tend to see it very overused. I would much prefer, and we see much bigger crop responses from potassium sulfate. Even though it is more expensive, it provides an economic return much greater than potassium chloride in, in our experience. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about sulfur. Sulfur is fascinating. I love working with sulfur because of sulfur's association to lipids, plant fats and oils. Believe me, there is a reason the Bible talks about the fat of the land. I love fats. I love fats. <clears throat> so. There's a lot of background here that I uh, haven't really had the opportunity to share. Um, so 
Before I talk about sulfur, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the formation of organic matter and how organic matter is built in soil. It's very different in all likelihood from what you have learned in the past. So it is possible that the, the single fastest way, I'm just going to give you guys a very high level overview. There's a lot of science here and I'm afraid I'm not going to do it justice in just a few minutes, but um, the single fastest way to build soil organic matter is to grow extraordinarily healthy crops. Crops healthy enough that they produce elevated levels of fats and oils and lipids in the leaf and send those lipids out through the root system. You can build soil organic matter faster with really healthy crops than you can by adding compost, by adding humates, by adding sugar or molasses, by growing cover crops. You can grow, build organic matter faster that way than you can doing anything else. The top three ecosystems for sequestering carbon and building soil organic matter very quickly. Number one is a young growth coniferous forest that is growing very rapidly. Number two is a perennial polyculture of grasses that are being intensively managed, intensive rotational grazed with livestock. And number three is healthy, high quality corn production. You can build soil organic matter faster with healthy corn production than you can growing any other crop. And yet we have the exact opposite of that happening in most of agriculture today where corn usually tends to deplete soil organic matter. So how does this work? Very simply, um, when you have, again as a frame of reference, most plants are only photosynthesizing at about 20 to 30 percent of their inherent photosynthetic efficiency every 24 hour photo period. When you work with foliar sprays, properly designed foliar sprays, you can increase that number all the way up to 60 to 80 percent or more. So when that happens, these plants now have a surplus of energy. They have more energy than they need. The first thing that will happen is they'll st start sending a lot of sugars out through the root system. The second thing that will happen is they will start storing that surplus energy in the form of lipids, fats and oils. So most plants will have a minimum of about one and a half to one and three quarter percent fat on a dry matter basis. That's the minimum level that they need just to form cell membranes. But then as they become healthier, that fat content can increase all the way up to 4%, 6%. I've seen as high as 8% fat content on forage crops. So now you have plant that has a much higher lipid concentration. So when that happens, these plants now begin sending lipids out through the roots as root exudates. Now you have lipids in the soil profile. So first, the plant starts transmitting sugars to the root system. And when it transmits sugars to the root system, that triggers bacterial digestion which is that bacterial digestive process is called mineralization. Why? Because bacteria, uh, with this plant is sending out sugars. Sugars are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There is no calcium, no magnesium, no potassium in sugar. There are no minerals in sugar. And yet bacteria need minerals to form their own cells. So they extract minerals from the soil mineral matrix, incorporate them into their own bodies, and then as that bacterial population cycles, the minerals contained within their own cells are released into the soil environment in the form of organic acid chelates and amino acid chelates that plants can now very readily absorb. That process is called mineralization. When plants begin absorbing microbial metabolites, they become very energy efficient. They begin storing, uh, uh, forming higher levels of lipids. Now they start sending higher levels of lipids to the root system. Here's where it starts getting really interesting. Bacteria can't digest fat. That's why in our culture and many years ago, um, throughout America, people used to preserve meat by storing it in fat because bacteria can't digest fats. But fungi can. So when you, get, you, when you start sending lipids into the soil system, you now trigger fungal digestion instead of bacterial digestion. And the fungal digestive process is very different in that when fungi ingest something, they simply digest it over and over and over again until it reaches a point at which it can be digested no further. At that point, that compound is now referred to as a stable humic substance. We're talking about humic substances and organic matter that has a half-life in the soil in hundreds of years. It does not degrade in the soil profile. It is extremely stable. So the interesting part, however, is that those humic substances, fungi digest until the point at which it can be digested no further. What do you think establishes the cutoff point? the lipid concentration, the fat concentration. Stable humic substances have a fat concentration of about 38 to 42%. So what this means is you can have 
a field with two, uh, two different fields, two different crops, or cover crops, let's say for the sake of discussion. One field, they have the exact same amount of biomass. They have 10,000 pounds of crop biomass per acre. One field is 2% fat content. The other field is 8% fat content. The field that is 8% fat content will produce four times more stable organic matter than the field that is 2% fat content, even though the amount of crop biomass is identical. But where it gets really interesting is when you can facilitate this with a living crop. This is how you can actually build soil organic matter by growing a, while growing a crop because um, with corn, for example, corn is a very efficient photosynthesizer, produces a tremendous amount of biomass, produces a lot of sugar production per acre, and it can transmit a lot of sugars and a lot of fats and oils out through the root system. So there is a strong association between sulfur in the soil and in the plant and lipid production, fat production. This is a very important piece. So if we look at carbon sequestration from a chemistry perspective, um, the formula looks something like this. 30 parts of carbon is associated with one part nitrogen. And 10 parts of nitrogen are associated with one part of carbon. Or excuse me, sulfur. So one part, uh, let's look, let me, let me rephrase that. One part of sulfur stabilizes and holds 10 parts of nitrogen. And those 10 parts of nitrogen stabilize and hold 300 parts of carbon. That is stable organic matter. So the extension of that is that one part sulfur will hold and stabilize 300 parts carbon. And nitrogen is the intermediary between those two. That's looking at it from a chemistry perspective. So that means that when you want to hold carbon and build soil organic matter, uh, a different way of looking at this because of sulfur's association with lipids is that the organic residues, the cover crops that are incorporated, are simply going to continue being digested and continue being processed until they reach that chemistry ratio of one part sulfur, 10 parts nitrogen, 300 parts carbon. It will keep digesting until it reaches that salt. So sulfur is the baseline. It will keep digesting all the way down. And, uh, sulfur is the minimum common denominator. It digests down to that point. That's from a chemistry perspective. You can also flip that and look at it from a biochemistry perspective, and the biochemistry perspective is the lipid component that I was just talking about. So they will digest down the lowest common denominator of lipids. So as you can see, you can begin to understand why I'm really passionate about fats. I love fats. But the important part is that these lipids inside plant structure are the foundational building blocks for what, uh, in plain English, we call essential oils. Essential oils are phytoalexins, resveratrol, phenolic compounds, terpenoids, sesquiterpenes, bioflavonoids. They're all these aromatic compounds that plants produce as plant protectants to protect themselves from ultraviolet radiation, from insect attack, from disease attack. And uh, at this stage, when plants have adequate levels of sulfur in these immune compounds, they become very resistant to a very broad range of different um, disease and insect pests. So sulfur is slowly mobile. It moves around fairly slowly. It can be deficient in either the new or in the old leaves. And we very seldom see deficiencies, although it is possible. Many farmers are observing, are uh, applying sulfates in some form, either it's potassium sulfate or calcium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. And it is absorbed very quickly, so it's very readily corrected. And in some cases, when you have excessive levels of nitrate, it can prevent sulfur from moving into the plant well, although we very seldom see that be the case. Yes? Can you rest for a minute? I was just getting started. Maybe we'll get on your favorite topic here in a minute. Thinking about when I went to school, and that's been a long time ago, they talked about hemicellulose was the material in the corn that made it very resistant to decomposition. That led to the how does, how does that term fit in with what you just told me? Hemicellulose is, um, the, the, the difference is what I'm describing. Um, okay, so organic matter is this blanket terminology that is used to describe a very broad array of different types of compounds in the soil structure. And I'm referring to a specific subcomponent of organic matter, which is stable humic substances. Uh, the, which often represents as little as um, 
20% to as much as 40% of the total aggregate number. The remainder of that number is undecomposed crop residue, um, the actual living fraction of organic residue. So there's a big part of that makes up the rest of that number. So what they're referring to is that the hemicellulose component, which degrades very slowly, does contribute to the organic matter number as the rest of that number. I'm referring to this one specific segment, which I'm sure as agronomists, many of you have observed this, you see farms that are very degraded. The soil has been very abused. And yet, even in spite of all that abuse, they still have organic matter of, let's say, 1.2 to 1.5%. And no matter what the farmer does, it never goes below that number. It's because that specific fraction is the stable humic substance fraction that does not degrade. It is going to stick around. It's going to stay there. That is the fraction that we really want to build. And that's the fraction that I'm talking about. Oxidation. Oxidation. Right. And uh, what's going on with the microbes and the, and the sulfur? How is all that happening? Now, that's going from a virgin land to product crop production. Well, if you have, you said 12 to 15 percent organic matter? Sometimes more. It depends on the soil type and the wetness and the profile. All right. That. So I would say that uh, you only have. It's not common to have such high organic matter soils. I mean, muck soils, there's a few exceptions to that. But it would be my uh, first guess, without knowing more about the situation, would be my first guess that one of the reasons you have such high numbers is that you have a lot of undecomposed organic residue. And as you start that decomposition process and the oxidation process, that number rapidly shrinks and rapidly dwindles. So one of the things that you can do to uh, hold more of that, I mean, again, you're talking about these several different fractions. So you have this big fraction that is undecomposed or isn't fully processed yet, isn't fully digested yet. And the goal should be to convert as much of that undecomposed fraction to the stable humic substance fraction rather than just letting it oxidize and disappear into the air as CO2. That's really what we should try to accomplish. Yes? Uh, I, I got a question. So where I come from, we raise a lot of peppermint for you know, peppermint oil. And, um, it's, it's sometimes it, it seems like it's a crapshoot of how much oil is actually in you know our peppermint when we're raising it. So you know we'll have a windrow that's big, lush, beautiful, but not much peppermint oil, and then we'll have this pitiful-looking windrow that produces more oil. And it's kind of common knowledge, or what we've always thought is you've got to stress the peppermint in order to bring up the oil content. Mm -hmm. And I just I you know I'm not really sure what actually is going on there mm -hmm. to do that. I just gave you the goose that laid the golden egg, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a spectrum. And the highest oil concentrations are found at both ends of the spectrum. So when you have a plant that is stressed, it's going to produce higher concentrations of these immune compounds, which are the essential oils that you're looking for when it's really stressed. And then you have this middle segment where the plant is lush, it's healthy, it has, or it's considered to be healthy, it has a high nitrogen content, it's growing very rapidly, and it has a low oil concentration because it has all this biomass. Right. And then you take it to the other end of the spectrum where you have supremely high levels of health, very aggressive photosynthesis, now you can go back up to where again you have this high oil concentration and in fact the oil concentration in those extremely healthy plants is going to be higher than on the plants that were stressed. So the, the high oil content is at both ends of the spectrum and not in the middle. Okay. So the key is to keep it super healthy. Yes. Yeah. And reduce nitrogen applications and all the other stuff that dilutes it out. You don't want to produce a lot of biomass. You want to produce a high oil concentration. You can manage, you can manage nutrition to, to produce that specific effect. It's not that difficult, actually. Any other questions about my favorite topic? <laughs> all right. So. Moving on, um, let's talk about phosphorus for just a little bit. Phosphorus is very interesting in that uh, the one thing that I want you guys to remember about phosphorus is that it is the energy transfer mechanism. It is the belt that connects the engine to the machinery or the, the drive shaft or whatever mechanism you want to use. Uh, 
So um, it's very critical for energy transferred, adenosine triphosphate. I don't need to get into all the biochemistry of it. But what happens very simply is that if you have a plant, if you have everything else flowing well, you have really, you've moved photosynthesis, you have really efficient photosynthesis, the plant is photosynthesizing really well. If you don't have phosphorus to harness all the energy that you're producing, it's not doing you any good at all. Uh, phosphorus deficiency is actually a deficiency that we see very common, commonly. So it's, phosphorus is very mobile. Uh, it first becomes deficient in the new growth. And there are a number of things that can contribute to uh, deficiency situations. When we have excessive levels of potassium, it will suppress phosphorus absorption, phosphorus availability. Uh, and I should make a note here, and I mentioned this also when we talked about potassium. Um, within the, when I talked about the nutrient interactions diagram, all the cations antagonize each other, all the anions antagonize each other, there is one notable exception. That is phosphorus and potassium. Excess of phosphorus creates potassium deficiencies. Excess of potassium creates phosphorus deficiencies. That is the one distinct exception to those two groups. So um, when you have excessive levels of zinc, it can create phosphorus deficiencies. And this is a challenge that we often see when, we have, when farmers have the practice of doing a very intense localized concentration of zinc. They want to do one or two foliars a year with a very aggressive zinc application, it can create a temporary phosphorus deficiency just because of that aggressive zinc application. Um, when we have uh, phytase enzyme or phytate inhibitors being added to poultry or livestock manure, particularly uh, usually commonly to poultry manure or hog manure and applied to the soil, that can create or, uh, phosphorus deficiencies. And when you have dysfunctional soil biology, one of the there are two response, there's a number of responses that we see. When we put on very strong microbial biostimulants, it would be expected, if they're effective, it would be expected to see an increase in silicon absorption, silicon uptake, be expected to see an increase in phosphorus uptake, assuming that there is a phosphorus reserve in the soil profile, and it would be expected to see an increase in the um, metals which can oxidize, manganese, iron, and copper, particularly. We would ex and assuming that there are levels of the adequate levels of those minerals in soil profile, we would expect to see those minerals increase. So uh, we found that when we have phosphorus in the soil profile, obviously phosphorus locks up very easily. It's very reactive as a triple negative charged anion. It binds with calcium and magnesium and aluminum and iron and everything that it comes into contact with very quickly and requires biology to release that. So when we have good biology, we expect to see a phosphorus response. We look at silicon. The one thing that you guys need to know about silicon is that silicon is a cell membrane shield. Silicon has a very synergistic relationship with calcium. And so uh, we talk about the critical importance of calcium for cell membrane integrity. We find that when plants have higher levels of silicon, uh, it produces a very strong shield that reduces the penetration of fungal um, hyphae into the cells, particularly on the epidermal cells, on the leaf surface. So there's a lot of discussion about the use of potassium silicate or various silicon sources as foliar sprays to reduce the incidence of powdery mildew, downy mildew, and so forth. And um, the reality is that the Earth's surface, I mean soil, is 23% silicon. There is a generous supply of silicon in the soil profile, but most of it is not available. It's tied up uh, as in the mineral form. Uh, plants absorb silicon from the soil profile in the form of monosilicic acid. And the best way to provide available silicon is to have uh, really good, uh, really aggressive biology. Again, as I said earlier, aggressive biology is going to uh, drive silicon absorption. And uh, another interesting nutrient interaction is that silicon applications to the, to the plant or to the soil of available silicon tend to drive phosphorus availability. So you can actually get a phosphorus response from a silicon application. Um, silicon, because of its association with calcium, is not mobile. Uh, it doesn't move around very quickly. And that is because it tends to be, it's a, build, it's a brick in the wall. It gets used to build cell membranes. And uh, once it has been uh, utilized, it tends to stay put and not move around inside the plant structure. 
Um, areas in which silicon is deficient, in, uh, in my personal opinion, every single plant is always silicon deficient. You can never have too much of it. Um, and in areas where it's particularly deficient, uh, you can often increase availability by providing adequate levels of calcium and boron. When you have low calcium and low boron, you do not get good silicon absorption. And again, the connection to really good biology. So now we get to the fun part. This is exciting. How many of you in here think that, uh, how many of you in here have ever seen an iron deficient crop? Okay. How many of you have ever seen crops that uh, nobody thought were iron deficient? Well, actually, okay, so when you take a soil analysis across the majority of this country of North America, a continent, or for most soil analysis, iron levels will always come back excessive. You consistently see really high iron levels. There are a few exceptions, but that's the case. 95% of the time for most of the geology that we work with. Always, soil tests always show that we have excess of iron. When we take a tissue analysis, um, 70 plus percent of the time, tissue analysis will always show that we have excess of levels of iron. And yet, when we do a sap analysis, 90% of the time, sap analysis will show that we have an iron deficiency. And the icing on the cake is when you put on an iron application, you get a very strong crop response from an iron application, even though the tissue analysis and the soil analysis shows that you have adequate levels of iron. So why is that? What's going on? What is really going on is that plants can only utilize iron in the reduced form. And the majority of iron in the soil profile and the plant profile is actually in the oxidized form, which is basically rust. Oxidized iron is the form of rust which it shows up on the, on the lab report. It shows up in the tissue analysis on the soil analysis, but it is not physiologically active inside the plant structure. So you put on the correct form of iron and you get this tremendous crop response. So for iron, I'm going to tell you two things that you need to remember about iron instead of just one. The first, the one thing you need to remember about uh, iron is that it is the wrench that constructs chlorophyll. It is not a part of chlorophyll, but it builds chlorophyll. So earlier I said that there are four nutrients that turn a plant dark green. Those four are um, nitrogen and magnesium and iron. Those three will do it the most strongly. The fourth, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is manganese. Manganese is different from the other three. But the first three are all involved in the construction of chlorophyll. But um, that isn't really the most interesting part about iron, however. It's very critical for chlorophyll construction. But most importantly, iron is the foundational um, enzyme cofactor, or it's not really the correct terminology, but it's the one of the foundational building blocks to build all of these various carotenoids. So when you look at uh, photon flux and uh, the, the, um, the various photosynthetic pathways, if uh, remembering the photosystem 2 pathway, I'm forgetting some of the technical terminology, but you have this entire um, pathway that is composed of all these various carotenoids, astaxanthin, zeaxanthin, so forth, and all these carotenoids pick up a very specific wavelength. So you have this spectrum of these seven different carotenoids that pick up specific wavelengths they all pick up photons and they transfer these photons into chlorophyll. So let me just make, translate that into plain English. Very simply, when you have a plant that has generous levels of iron, has high concentrations of these carotenoids, they become incredibly efficient at photosynthesizing because they now pick up a much broader bandwidth of the visible light spectrum than plants that have iron deficiencies. So you will see your sugar production in every 24 hour photo period increase substantially when a plant has adequate levels of iron. So um, iron is, has intermediate flow mobility. It is somewhat mobile. It moves around a little bit, but not, a, not very rapidly. Because of this, it can be deficient in either the old or the new leaves. And um, 
Areas, situations in which it is most commonly deficient are where you have uh, either oxidized or cal cal <coughs> excuse me, calcareous soils, where you have limestone-based soils. Uh, <coughs> There's a lot of consideration given to soil pH. Everyone thinks that soil pH is a major driver of nutrient availability for these various, particularly for these various trace minerals. And that's true. But there's another factor that has a m much greater impact on nutrient availability than soil pH, which nobody ever talks about, and that is EH, oxidation reduction. Has a much bigger impact on nutrient availability than pH ever does. And it's really the EH, or the redox factor. When you have these uh, very oxidized soils, very calcareous soils, you tend to have very high levels of oxidized iron, and the plants cannot absorb the oxidized iron, which is why we see soil analysis that have very high iron levels, but the plants are actually deficient. Uh, again, it is the function of biology to convert this oxidized iron into the reduced form, which is when, when we see uh, why, when we see very aggressive uh, biology, we tend to see increases in iron absorption in plants and better photosynthesis as a result. Uh, when we have soil challenges where we have inadequate supplies of iron being delivered from the soil, the easiest way to fix it, the fastest shortcut to fix it is with foliar applications. It can take some time to turn the soil around until it can provide adequate iron levels. And the reality is, again, we have generous levels of iron. The Earth's crust is 4% iron, but uh, the plants are not picking it up. The one thing that I want you to remember about manganese is that manganese is the magic black box. I say that somewhat facetiously, and yet, in one of the initial books that I referenced, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, about 30% of that entire book is dedicated to manganese associations with specific, disease, uh, specific diseases. Manganese is connected with so many different diseases that we find when we fix the manganese problems on a farm, uh, many of the different operations, we have just fixed 60 to 70% of all their disease problems just by fixing that one thing alone. So, the one thing that I want you to remember about manganese is that manganese is the element that splits the water molecule and water hydrolysis for photosynthesis. So what, during the photosynthesis process, plants are absorbing water from the soil, they're absorbing carbon dioxide from the air, and then they're combining those two elements to form glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen is produced and released into the atmosphere during that process. But in order for photosynthesis to happen, the very first thing that has to happen before any of this combination can happen is that water has to be split into H and OH. That's called water hydrolysis. Without water hydrolysis, nothing else happens. And manganese is responsible for water hydrolysis. So that means that you can have generous levels of nitrogen, you can have adequate levels of magnesium and iron and sulfur and all these various things that are involved in the photosynthetic process but if you don't have manganese, none of, nothing else matters. So everything else is going to be, obviously in the photosynthetic process, everything is suppressed to the lowest common denominator. And in many cases, we find manganese is the lowest common denominator that is actually holding back the photosynthesis process. Um, as I described earlier this morning, manganese is not flow mobile. It doesn't move around in plant structure, so it can be deficient in either the old or the new leaves. And Similar to iron, it tends to become deficient in very oxidized soils. And uh, when we have dysfunctional soil microbiology, that tends to produce oxidized minerals during the digestive process instead of reduced minerals. And particularly when we have a history of aggressive glyphosate applications, we will tend to have manganese availabilities or uh, manganese deficiencies in the soil profile and in plant systems because glyphosate actually binds manganese in the soil profile and holds it unavailable for decades. So you will not have very good levels of manganese availability when you have a lot of glyphosate application. And usually, when we talk about intense glyphosate applications, people tend to think about broad acre crop production, corn and soybeans, alfalfa, et cetera, alfalfa more recently so. But the reality is that the most intense glyphosate applications usually happen in orchards, where you have tree fruit production in the row, under the row. So you're likely to, you can expect to see manganese deficiencies in that type of environment. Yes? So you're saying that 
The manganese is tied up in a plant, like on a Roundup Ready corn crop. Mm -hmm. And it's also tied up in manganese in the soil. What I was saying specifically is that manganese is tied up in the soil when you have a history of Roundup application. It is possible to have manganese tied up inside the plant and be chelated. What is Roundup? Roundup is a chelation agent. It's a very aggressive chelation agent. And so when it's associated with manganese, it is entirely possible for a plant to pick up manganese from the soil profile that is chelated with glyphosate and hold that chelated glyphosate and manganese in the plant tissue, where you get a tissue analysis result that will show that you have adequate levels of manganese and yet you actually have a manganese deficiency. We don't know yet, haven't been able to identify specifically whether um, SAP analysis differentiates between glyphosate chelated or not, but I can hardly imagine that it does. Uh, what I know for certain is that on um, broad acre crop production in the Midwest, several instances, this was before we were using uh, SAP analysis, when we were using tissue analysis, we had crops that showed they had adequate levels of manganese, and yet they were showing the classic visual symptoms of manganese deficiency, and we put on a manganese application, and the problem disappeared. So it, I believe it is absolutely possible to have manganese that is chelated with glyphosate in a plant structure, unfortunately. It's not the good news, but it's the reality. All right, so um, the one thing to remember about zinc is that it is directly associated with leaf size and also with superoxide dismutase, SOD. So superoxide dismutase is kind of the kingpin of the, uh, of, of, it's a major leader of expressing a plant's overarching uh, immune system integrity. Obviously, having really large leaves is directly associated with having really large fruit. The larger the leaf size, the larger the fruit size. So managing zinc applications throughout the year to, um, to develop large leaves and to develop fruit size is very important. However, uh, one of the things, I'm not even sure if I have this, I don't even have this on this slide, uh, we have seen um, on cherry production, for example, uh, we have worked with cherry orchards that have had very in aggressive, very intense zinc applications. And those intense zinc applications, they were, they were addressing zinc, but they weren't addressing any of the other trace minerals. So we changed that. We greatly reduced zinc applications and started addressing manganese and these other uh, trace minerals. And manganese, as manganese levels went up, other really fun stuff started happening. Powdery mildew started disappearing. Bacterial canker, we were able to completely re regress bacterial canker. Uh, and we had some really interesting observations on a number of other diseases as well. But the interesting part was that even though uh, we reduced, in fact, we completely eliminated zinc applications on several of these orchards that had a history of high zinc applications. There was a lot of zinc in the soil, a lot of zinc already in the trees. We completely cut zinc applications stopped them completely. The sap analysis told us that we had a generous supply in the plant sap. Leaf size did not drop. Leaf size remained exactly the same without any additional applications of zinc when we started addressing the other trace minerals. Um, similar to iron, zinc has intermediate flow and mobility, can be deficient in either the old or the new leaves, and it particularly most often becomes deficient when we have excessive phosphorus supplies uh, in the soil profile or when we have calcareous soils. The one thing that I would like for you to remember about boron is that um, boron is directly associated with fruit development and allowing carbohydrates to move into the sugar sinks. So again, you have three sugar sinks, new growth, root development, and fruit. If you have problems with hollow heart, it's most likely because you have a boron deficiency that is not allowing the carbohydrates to move into the fruit. So um, boron also has intermediate flow, uh, flow, ability, flow mobility, becomes first deficient in the new growth. It has several deficiency scenarios. Um, when you have extremely high levels of calcium combined with low pHs, it's a very interesting agronomic dynamic. Doesn't happen very often, but we have seen it on several occasions. When you have excessive calcium and low pHs, 
it will create a very severe boron deficiency. And I'm talking specifically in the soil profile. Of course, boron is an anion, negatively charged. It leaches through the soil fairly quickly, and it also gets tried up in a drought situation, so you can have boron deficiencies. Um, now, boron is the trapdoor that allows sugars to move into the roots, down to the root system, or into the fruit. So it's kind of the gateway mechanism. So one of the things um, when we talk about BRICS readings, when we look at the BRICS readings in a plant leaf or throughout the course of the day, as I described earlier, we have this 24-hour photo, uh, photo cycle, which means that the sugar concentration should be highest in the leaf in late afternoon. And then it should drop and be at its lowest early in the morning because all that sugar should have been metabolized, should have been transported out of the leaf and should have been metabolized. There should be approximately a 65 to 70 percent drop. So if you're at a 10 in the afternoon, late afternoon, you should be down to about a 3 or a 4 the following morning. If that doesn't happen, if you don't have that fluctuation happening, it means that sugars are not being transported properly from the leaves into the sugar sinks, and that is most likely associated with a boron deficiency. So when you have a boron deficiency, you're not going to have sugar transport moving throughout the plant as it needs to be happening. The one thing that you need to remember about copper is that copper is associated also with very strong photosynthesis and disease resistance. And particularly, copper is associated with flexibility, stem flexibility. So if you have problems with uh, plants where the leaves or the stems are very brittle, they want to snap or break easily. This is a problem sometimes for broccoli production or for a variety of different brassicas, uh, even, can even be for apples and apple stems. Um, copper is going to give you a much greater degree of flexibility, where you can actually bend and twist those stems much more without having them break or snap off. Um, copper also has intermediate flow mobility like many of these other trace minerals do. Uh, and it has two specific scenarios in which it tends to become deficient very quickly, and that is when, it has, when you have excessive levels of ammonium or excessive levels of phosphorus. The plant will not absorb copper very well. When we look at molybdenum, um, the one thing to know about molybdenum is that it is the key enzyme cofactor for the nitrate reductase enzyme and is critically involved in nitrate metabolism. So, when I talked about managing nitrate and the association with magnesium, sulfur, and molybdenum, all three of those elements have to be in adequate supply in order for the nitrate levels to go down to zero. If you have adequate levels of magnesium and adequate levels of sulfur but a molybdenum deficiency, it's not going to happen. All three of them have to be adequate in order for nitrate to drop. So, um, molybdenum has intermediate mobility, it can move around on a limited basis, and it is almost universally deficient. We very, very seldom see test reports come back showing adequate levels of molybdenum. It does happen on occasion, but I've seen it maybe a dozen times in all the thousands of samples that we have run. And so uh, we include molybdenum as a standard practice on every uh, nutrition system that we put together. We put in molybdenum applications throughout the growing season. So then, of course, there are a whole host of additional elements that are not measured and are not reported on the SAP analysis, but that are now being considered. Uh, a few of them are being considered essential. Others are being uh, uh, are considered critical for some uh, crop varieties in some specific situations. We have cobalt, nickel, strontium, selenium, vanadium, iodine, silver, rubidium, aluminum, lithium, and titanium. Um, I could talk about some of these. Um, at length, but I'll just maybe selectively talk about a few of them. Um, cobalt. I've, I've touched on cobalt yesterday, and uh, the one thing that I would like for you to know about cobalt, uh, it's, it's very strongly associated with uh, disease resistance in a number of different ways, but particularly, the one thing you know about cobalt is that cobalt is directly associated with cytokine and production in the growing shoot and the growing root tips. So when we talk about plant hormone balances, cytokine versus auxin, these, in these various um, plant hormones uh, balances, cytokines are produced in growing root tips. 
in direct association with adequate supplies of cobalt. So 80% of the cobalt in an entire plant structure is going to be in the growing root tips. That's where most of it is concentrated. Um, regarding nickel, uh, I described our experience with uh, nickel and uh, ammonium metabolism in the leaf. Strontium is really fascinating. The one thing about strontium is that uh, there, there, it's very well recognized that we have this trio of synergistic elements between calcium, silicon, and boron, where the three of them tend to work very closely together. The fourth element, which is something this is, I've been talking about this for a decade, is strontium. We find that strontium applications actually improve and enhance the mobility and the absorption of calcium and silicon and these other elements that it's associated with. Selenium, of course, has a number of characteristics um, particularly known <clears throat> for disease suppression on a number of uh, viral and fungal diseases. And uh, vanadium is fascinating. Iodine and silver are really fascinating that iodine is very strongly associated with um, uh, known to suppress diseases of all the Erwinia and Xanthomonas families. Um, silver also has very strong disease suppression. And I failed to include lanthanum on this list, but lanthanum also has some very interesting properties that I think more people should be paying attention to. Okay. This is what we need about now, right? <laughs> So with the SAP analysis, in addition to measuring and reporting all of these different minerals that we just got done describing, also measures several other uh, elements, or several other compounds. And in particular, one of the things that it measures that we pay attention to is sugars. The sugar number in the plant leaf structure is obviously correlated with the plant's total energy supply. And so we have these different um, groupings of carbohydrates based on their complexity. You have the monosaccharides, you have uh, oligosaccharides, you have polysaccharides uh, with, with varying degrees of complexity. In the group of monosaccharides, you have these very simple sugars, short chain sugars, that are uh, termed either reducing sugars or non-reducing sugars. So the non-reducing sugars, what this terminology refers to, simply means that they can't be reduced any further. They are at sugar in its most simplest form. They can't be broken down any further. And whereas the reducing sugars can be broken down further into the non-reducing sugars. So why is this important? Because when you take a Bricks reading with a refractometer, you should expect to see a substantial fluctuation in the sugar number from morning to evening. You would expect to see substantial fluctuation based on the weather conditions. And the, <coughs> the sugar number that is reported on the SAP analysis measures only the reducing sugars. It does not measure the non-reducing sugars which means that we eliminate the fluctuation. You no, you no longer have the, it's no longer the, the, the number, the metric is no longer as variable. So you're able to much more accurately measure from one test to the next uh, what that plant's relative energy level is over an extended uh, time period. It doesn't have the sensitivity, which also means that it doesn't have the uh, very high error rate and the high variability that a BRICS reading does. Um, there's many possible reasons for having low sugar. Basically, anything that slows down or reduces photosynthesis is going to reduce um, sugar concentrations. It is possible there is kind of an optimal range for sugar production in plant sap, and it is definitely possible to have excessive levels of sugar. When you have excessive levels of sugar, again, these simple sugars are the primary energy source and nutrient source for many of the disease organisms and the insects that we're trying to prevent. So um, in particular, there are uh, three common scenarios which we see producing artificially high sugar numbers. The first one is when you have 
very low levels of phosphorus. I talked about phosphorus being involved in energy transfer. Uh, one of the, the, the common visual symptom for phosphorus deficiency is purpling, purpling of the leaves or the stems. That happens, that purpling happens when the plant has excessive levels of sugars in the sap. It recognizes that that isn't healthy and it starts converting all those sugars to anthocyanins. So the anthocyanins are actually the purple coloring agents that we see. It's the exact same as the anthocyanins in blueberries and so forth. Um, and that is a result of a phosphorus deficiency. Uh, when you have low levels of boron, it can also give you excessive levels or very high sugar levels in the plant sap, as I described earlier, because it doesn't allow the sugars to move into the fruit so, uh, or into the various sugar sinks. So if you have watermelon that have splitting or hollow heart, it'll be most likely because of boron deficiency, not allowing sugars to move in and fill the fruit. Same holds true of strawberries. When you have strawberries that have that hollow stem down the center, uh, it can be boron, it can also be potassium. We'll, do, we'll have that same effect, but to a lesser degree. Um, and then the third, which can trigger artificially high sugar levels, is um, pesticide applications. And I use the word pesticide as in its overarching generic sense. Um, this refers specifically, it, it's most powerful, the most powerful effect comes from fungicides and from herbicides. Even though the herbicides may not have a direct negative effect on the crop, uh, they tend to really shut down that plant's metabolism and uh, where it doesn't metabolize sugars nearly as well and you end up with very high sugar concentrations. So uh, many years ago, in the 50s or 60s perhaps, I forget the exact time frame, a French researcher, Francis Chaboso, published a book uh, titled Healthy Crops. That was a summary of all of his research and the research of several of his colleagues in France and in Brazil where they were studying the differences between healthy plants and unhealthy plants. And he developed some of his own terminology. One of the things that he talked about was protein synthesis versus proteolysis. And he made this observation that whenever they sprayed an insecticide, a certain group of insecticides or fungicides onto a plant it decreased that plant's health and it made it even more susceptible to insects and disease attack in the future. So what he was describing is that when it, any pesticide application triggers what is called pro, proteolysis, protein breakdown, and it makes the plant even more unhealthy and it increases the susceptibility to future infections. So uh, we see that same effect where some of these pesticides can actually increase the plant's sugar concentrations in the plant sap. If we look at plant sap pH, uh, one of my mentors developed a plant sap pH chart in which he described that when the ideal, based on uh, his experience and calculations, um, the ideal plant sap pH was a pH of 6.4. As the pH increased above 6.4, you had increasing susceptibility to insects. As the pH decreased below 6.4, you had increasing susceptibility to bacterial or fungal diseases. So you had insects on one side of the spectrum and diseases on the other. And so uh, what we have, we have found this to be generally true. Uh, there are a few crops that we still have some question marks about whether this might be completely the case. Uh, but the interesting part is that while the pH number appears to be the same for many different crops, the nutrient ratios that constitute that pH are substantially different from crop to crop. So they have a very different acid-base balance for the different crop profiles. Plant sap analysis also measures EC, the electrical conductivity of the plant sap. And we find this to be a very important number. Um, there are essentially five elements that drive the electrical conductivity. They are uh, nitrates, chlorides, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. So we need to have an adequate level of EC, but when we have an excess, uh, as with what happens very commonly with either sodium or, potas or, sodium or chloride, uh, when we have excessive EC, it will actually cause leaf burn. That is, it's a blackout from excessive electrical conductivity. And the reality is that we see this, we associate it with sodium and chloride, but when we have high levels of any of these other elements, uh, it doesn't take much to tip the scale and to actually develop an excess of EC. 
The same uh, also holds true on the other end of the spectrum. If we have an inadequate EC, if we don't have enough of these electrolytes in the plant, uh, it's going to, we don't have enough electrical conductivity, that's going to slow down growth and slow down plant development. 